And another one, another one, Mo Ashley, go Ashley, we back, we back, we partying on a Monday night, Monday night, supposed to be like Friday night, Friday night, on a Monday night, we're doing some chess, it's your boy Jim Ashley, it's dinner time for me, but you know, I'm holding off my dinner until I show you guys this last game right here, because people ask me to show my games, now that I'm streaming, they're like, yeah, you're showing all the other games, man, show one of your games, like, all right, we'll show you one of my games. This is one of my all-time favorites. It's not the whole game, but the finish is worth the price you paid. I don't know what you paid to be watching this, but the price, whatever price you paid, this finish here is worth the price you paid, okay? So you're going to like this one. This game was inspired by the sun and fun of St. Martin. So I had black. And uh, let's see, let me get a position up. And the game went a little something like this. Started off in English. Super boring, A6. And now I play this move. This is called provocative. The provocateur. The provocateur. Okay. And a topless immortal. <laughs> That's a good name. <laughs> Whew. I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I was just giving a little background data. Okay. I had this really ridiculous idea. I did this on purpose. I knew what I was going to do. And I played this from time to time. And this position, white could probably completely refute my position by playing his bishop to e3, let's say after e4. Like really make my rook look silly on this square. But it takes a little while to prove this fact. So, uh, he decided to play bishop b2 and just play like a normal position because he figured like, what am I doing? So I played bishop b7. And then I played d6. And this was, you're going to see the whole point of my setup. We need two. And this is the point. Queen on a. This rook looks ridiculous. Oh, yes, it does. I know it looks ridiculous, but it's hard to exploit. And this position with the queen on a8 obviously is bearing down on this long diagonal. And it makes it just difficult for white to get anything going. And I'm obviously this is, a, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say obviously, but this is a hedgehog setup. This pawn formation by black, not putting anything on the fourth rank. It's like one of those, you know, you can't cross the line. You can't hit me. Be careful. You can't hit me. That kind of position. White has space. It looks like a big bind, but it's hard for white to make obvious progress. And this, is a very, this was a very popular position in the 80s and the 90s, this type of position. So, but this rook on a7 is a bit weird. But it's the only way I can get my queen to a8. Well, it's a way to get my queen to a8. You could also go queen c7. You could put your rook on c8, go queen c7. Uh, let's change the arrows. I could, you could put a rook on c8, go queen c7, queen b8, and queen a8. So that takes four moves. Mine takes two moves. But my rook is somewhat strange on the square, at least for now. All right? And this rook will move, I believe, only once more in the entire game, if I'm not mistaken. So, interesting place for the rook. But let's keep it moving. So he plays all natural moves. Rook here. This rook on this line of the queen is one of those mysterious rook moves a la Nimzovich. If the game opens up along this file, the rook is sitting there. But it also gives the bishop a chance to back up. So, a deepish kind of move, this last one. So h3. Keeps going, moves his king off any long diagonal tactics. And now with his king where it is, I decide to do another little mysterious move, not so mysterious. I put the queen on b8. And now my queen is eyeing his king from afar. All right, now you look at this position and you're like, this is a lot of stuff in the way. There's a pawn here, there's a pawn here, there's a king here. And then he plays the move f4. So there's a lot of stuff in the way. That lot of stuff is going to turn into some stuff in a second. Like some stuff. So I played a move here that is natural to the position. I played g6. The bishop is headed to the g7 square. And now the thing about the hedgehog is like, you know, you said the hedgehog like has its, its spine. So you, the hedgehog is bound like this, but then you come and it expands on you. So it looks like white has all the space and white does. White has an edge in this position. But white has to be very careful. White has to be mindful because black has... Very interesting breaks, like a d5 break at the right moment or a b5 break at the right moment, and it just breaks open the position, and suddenly the hedgehog chose its power. Lucky for me, Shabalov did, it, did me the favor and opened the position himself. He was like, I'm not waiting on you. 
Again, this is the first time he's playing me. He don't know me from Adam. He's like, I'm going to come get you. Bing, let's open it up, grab some space. It's like, okay, I've been here. I'm taking it, I'm taking this. And I'm putting my knight on the side. The knight looks poorly placed, but it's not easy to chase it. Also, this bishop is getting ready to go to this square and attack this pawn at some point. This pawn is under pressure, so it's not easy to do anything. White's still better, by the way. I mean, white can be better. White should probably play the move knight to c6 to get my bishop from me. But that didn't suit his fancy. So Shabalov wanted me to do something. So he played a big mistake. A big mistake. The move bishop to c6. Looks like his position is kind of free-flowing. All right? He's pinning my knight. Obviously, I can't take the piece. Looks like I have to go passive. This next combination I calculated was maybe as good as I've calculated a combination, I, I think. From the sequence you're about to see, is insane. Okay? So, the main idea of the combination is not hard to spot. The nuances of the variation are where the combination gets fun. And so, with all these weaknesses that I pointed out, the long diagonal is mine. It's just perfume. But don't forget, there's a rook hanging on the e8 square, and it will continuously hang on e8 if you're not careful. All right? So the question is, given that you see the rook hanging in this position, should, I mean, it's like ding, 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 we see the tactics. Should I take on e5 to start so I can play bishop d6, or should I take on g3 and continue? The answer is to take on g3. Knight takes g3. Now, this is, you know, when you're playing against Alexander Shabalov, 2590, you know, GM, <laughs> you drop a move like, bang, hit him. I'm like 2360 at the time, maybe. So I'm outrated by this guy, and he just came from Latvia, and he's gotten the school of Mikhail Tal and Alexander Shirov, and, you know, Shirov. I mean, it's like fire breathers. And when you get to drop knight g3, and you're, on, you're like, boom. You know you made a move, right? <laughs> like, that's a fun move to make. Knight g3, blow up the position. Woo, 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 call the police. Okay, problem number one is king takes is met by the secondary sacrifice. Knight takes. Two knight sacrifices. Bing! And accepting the sacrifice. My rook is hanging, by the way, but bishop to d6 and... He just never has time to get out of this mess because the bishops, as we should know, the bishops are just skate. I mean, just like nasty. Like the diagonal pressure is nasty and the queen's going to follow and stream in right behind. So that knight is not going to work. But this is just the beginning of the combination. So he made a move. Now he realized, oh, S-ish, like what just happened. So he stops and calculates and he plays queen to F2. And now he's saying, well, your knight here is still hanging, and this knight I'm going to take with the queen, and everything's going to be hunky-dory. And I have another trick waiting for you. Unfortunately for him, I get to play knight takes e5 anyway. And now again, we have the same weird situation. My rook is hanging here. The knight is here. Uh, this is hanging. There's going to be all kinds of discoveries. What am I threatening, etc. If he dares to play queen takes g3 now, I'm down a piece, but I have a waiting move in bishop here. And this is unstoppable. I mean, just unstoppable. There's, there's nothing to do about the problem. And by the way, I'm only down a piece, so I'm threatening knight takes c6 as well. Right? So I'm just threatening to take this. But if you take my rook, then I can drop knight f3 on you and then take your queen with check. So all that's very hunky-dory good. But what he had prepared, that fortunately I calculated, was the move Rook takes e5, which now eliminates my queen's defense of my rook on e8. Remember, I was telling you this piece has been hanging for a while. But that's not a problem. After rook takes e5, I played queen takes e5. And I'm threatening some nasty discovery, right? So my rook's not hanging because I still got this discovery waiting for your queen. I'm going to hit you with check and wreck you, so you can't do that. So this threat is real. This threat is real. The threat is real. 
So he played queen takes g3. And again, everything is like everything is hanging from every which direction from everywhere. But here goes the variation. Queen takes on d4. And again, at the moment, I'm up uh, two pawns and an exchange, right? Two pawns and exchange, a rook for a knight. He can't touch my rook because bishop d6 is coming. But this is his intermezzo he prepared, the move rook to d1. Now guarding the d6 square, purportedly. And now when my queen moves, he's ready to take my rook for free. And d6 is guarded. Except it's not. Because <laughs> I play bishop d6 anyway. Bing, 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 boom, 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 hit him hard, boom, boom, what? Now the problem is, if he takes my queen, I grab a lot with check, and then grab that one, and I'm going to exchange into pawns, and that's Johnny Ballgame. No play. So bishop d6, still within the combination. He has to play queen takes. And now queen f2 check. We come to the conclusion of the combination, because now king here is forced. And queen takes b2, and he can't take my rook because his bishop is pinned. End of combo. Game over. Lights out. I'm up two pawns and an exchange. <laughs> Throw the gold coins, please. <laughs> Wake up. The end of the combo. That this this point of the combination with the king being pinned was the was the real sizzle in my nizzle. I. He tried to fight, he played knight e4. I took his bishop finally after years of research. And then my rook moved finally to connect my pieces. There is no check on the square because my queen is guarding it. So you get nothing back still within winning terms. He played rook f1 to try to get that move. I said, yeah, man, get that garbage out of here. Hitting my rook. Well, I know you're hitting my rook. What if I hit yours? Rook to g1. Well, let me turn a little mate if you touch my rook. Whoa, sorry about that. <laughs> mate if I touch your rook. All right. And so he protected. And now I'll move my rook. Threatening check. Threatening check. This knight is hanging. Everybody's dead. He played a last joke move. Knight takes f5. And I took on f5. The point being that. He resigned here because rook takes, I just take, and there is no perpet because my king's just going to march over, and there's no check on, on the E line, and I'm just going to march, and that's going to be that. Game over. So he resigned after playing knight f5, e f5, and that's how I beat Shabalov. Yeah. How's that? It wasn't a bad game, huh? It wasn't so bad. One underwear, one that I'm pretty proud of. Pretty proud of when you can beat your ball up like this. You feel good about yourself. You feel like, yeah, that's a good one. I mean, I beat him another nice one, meant another good game. But after that, he's like, nah, nah, <laughs> I'm, I'm Shabalov. Uh, yeah, you got me good some games as well. But I, yes, I did calculate this combination. It was not, you don't sack without calculating. I used to be able to calculate. No, I don't play chess for uh, with any hate. You know, I'm a lover, not a fighter. So, plus I got older, I think maybe that's the reason. I don't like to give that as the reason, but you know, before I used to be a machine. I was like, Whoa! my skills were fierce, and I did calculate it. Yes, so good combination. Sack first, think later. Nah, that's not how we do it. That's not how we do it. Uh, why does bishop e4 refute the position at the start? Bishop. Why does bishop e4 refute what position? What are you talking about? Flock of Mongeese, tell us, please, inform us. Why does it refute the position? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, at any rate, this position, this something interesting happened. A little story with this game. When I the game concluded at this position. And he shook my hand and walked away. Normally, you you know, you would say like congratulations or good game or let's analyze. He didn't talk to me at all. He just left. And Shabalov is one of the nicest guys you'd ever meet. So I was like, wow, like that's it. 
you know, nothing to, we normally, we normally always do a postmortem. Back in the day, we always did postmortems. Always. You were just like, oh, I got to go. There's one game a day. You go look at the game, see where the mistakes were, you know, where, where are the possible moves, where something else could have happened, etc. cetera. Uh, Oh, Bishop E3. Bishop E3 after Rook A7. It doesn't refute it. It's just a, a better way to play. That was the, the answer. But let me finish my story first. Um, so he went and he walked away. And I, I was really proud of the game. Obviously, it was a nice game. And then later that evening, he came over to me and he said, Maurice, I'm sorry. I apologize for not going over the game with you. I was just a little upset. I'm like, you know, that's class right there. That's class. He wasn't feeling good, lost, lost the bag, you know, lost like this. And uh, so he had to just let some steam off. And then he came back and he said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, man. I, you know, I was, I was upset. My apologies. Good game. It's like, wow. You know, when that's what you feel good, like the camaraderie among strong players. I was just becoming an IM at the time. So it felt good to beat somebody of that, that caliber. Uh, and the game was published in Chess Life a couple of months later. And Dmitry Gurevich did the annotation to the game. And he wrote, in his annotation, he wrote, my apologies to my friend, Alexander Shabalov. Right? That's literally what he wrote. My apologies to my friend, Alexander Shabalov. And then he, sh then he annotated the game, and he had, like, hockey analogies and stuff. It was like, hit him! Because <laughs> it was just a nice game. So... So he annotated it, and I, you know, then I felt really good, like, wow, getting some respect. You know, it always felt good when you could publish a couple of nice games because I was on the on the the other end of the hockey stick, bing, bing, by a lot of these GMs. You know, when you fight at that level, you try to become a GM, you're going to get beat down, and I took my beatings for sure, whoopings. But I hit, I hit back sometimes. You know, I could hit back. I hit back, and so that was uh, that was me hitting back. In this game now let's go back uh the position you're referring to if bishop e3 is what you're saying if i'm understanding you correctly bishop to b2 right here it doesn't refute my rook a7 i mean it's yeah i would say i would never play it if i knew that like e4 with the plan of putting let's say i played uh bishop b7 now and bishop e3 i'm always confronted with the problem of a4 a5 and this becomes just out of nowhere a challenge in the position and so, for example, if I D6, right, and you play A4, I don't want to play A5 in this position because a knight will have this square forever, right? Somebody will have this square forever. And if I move my rook, I have to be very mindful of the potential tactic of E5 with my undefended bishop. So suddenly I'm stuck for the position the way it is. My rook is, is not as well placed with this bishop always having this potent idea that I, like I have to be sensitive to. That was the problem with putting... The rook here early later i looked at it with a computer not later after this because we didn't have engines this is 93 so we didn't have any strong engines yet but much later when i looked at the game and the, the engine was like yeah your idea sucks <laughs> okay then well at least it worked once so <laughs> whatever you know we were flying by the seat of our pants analyzing stuff the days when you could just analyze and not worry about the computer going me me that sucks that's terrible. You're a pot, sir. Okay. Shut up. You can be creative.